Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Julian Krantz, and I'm the, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Brighton. Uh, I'm really delighted to see such a wonderful audience here this evening and to welcome you to the university and to introduce Phil Haynes on the occasion of his inaugural lecture as Professor of Public Policy at the University of Brighton. By way of a little background, not too embarrassing to uh, Professor Haynes started his studies at the then Trent Polytechnic, graduating in 1984 with a degree in Applied Social Sciences. Subsequently, he held a number of posts as a probation officer, as a project uh, officer working with offender rehabilitation, and as a welfare officer. It was also during this time that he undertook his uh, MSc in Advanced Education for Social Research Methods uh, through the European University being awarded his degree in 1991. In that same year, uh, Phil joined the University of Brighton as a lecturer in the then Department of Community Studies, now, of course, the School of Applied Social Science, and was promoted to senior lecturer in 1993 and principal lecturer in 2002. At the same time, Phil undertook his research towards his PhD, which he was awarded in 1998 by the University of Brighton for his work on the social complexity and governmental social care planning for the long-term ill. In 2005, he was made reader in social and public policy and was also the deputy head of school. And then finally in 2008, uh, Phil was made head of the School of Applied Social Science and at the same time was awarded the title of professor. And as you will hear in a moment, Phil's research expertise and interests lie in the application of complexity theory to social science. He has published a number of papers and articles in this area as well as on e-learning and online learning. His work on the quantitative evaluations of the theoretical application of complexity theory in social science are having a really significant influence, and he's been much in demand as a keynote speaker at international conferences, particularly in Europe and the Far East. Finally, Phil's research has attracted funding from a range of sources, including a number of health trusts, the Joseph Browntree Foundation, the Joseph Browntree Foundation, and the Economic and Social Research Council. So with this as a, a very short uh, introduction, it gives me very great pleasure to now invite uh, Professor Haynes to deliver his inaugural lecture entitled Complexity in Public Policy, Metaphors and Methods. Phil, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I feel very privileged to give this lecture and I very much enjoyed the challenge to summarise my academic focus. A few votes of thanks to those who have helped me along the way before I start. Firstly, thanks to Jan and my family for their patience and encouragement in the ups and downs of academic life. To Tony Hadley, who gave me my first job in academia. David Taylor, who's given me ongoing advice and guidance for over 10 years now. And thanks particularly to Peter Squires, Susan Ballack, Michael Hill, who over the years have encouraged me to persist with writing and research when other aspects of work threatened to take over. Many thanks to all my colleagues in the School of Applied Social Science for their commitment and inspiration, which makes it a really excellent place to work. Moving on to the lecture. In this lecture, I want to explain my interest in complexity theory and provide some illustrations of how its metaphors can assist with researching public policy and practicing policy management. My argument is based on the following two key points. Firstly, the concepts of complexity applied to the physical sciences can be used to explore questions in the social sciences, even though applications cannot be demonstrated in exactly the same way as in the natural sciences. Secondly, Complexity, complexity theory demonstrates a constant tension of instability and stability. In the real world of policy systems, I want to argue that research and practice have underestimated the volume of instability present. This provides formidable challenges to those working within policy systems. The Collins English Dictionary defines policy as a plan of action adopted or pursued by an individual, government, party or business. In the academic discipline of public policy, 
the task is often to summarise the line of argument and direction of decisions taken by government. Discussion of policy is frequently abstract and generalised. For example, when considering the actions and behaviour of national government, we talk of transport policy, health policy, economic policy, and even government policy in its broadest sense. Academics like Wayne Parsons, Michael Hill, have assisted the working definition of policy and helped to articulate the evolution of the recognised academic area of public policy, often aligned with the study and research of politics. These areas of study have been formalised and institutionalised in the US and the UK higher education establishments, resulting in specialist degrees. Here at Brighton, we offer social policy as a half degree, with other applied social science subjects, and also now an MPA, a Masters in Public Administration, that includes a module policy analysis. The link of policy with politics and ideology is well established. Policies are created within a highly political and contested arena, emerging from political debate. The political process leads to a formalised process of government, decisions and actions, clarified through legislation in political institutions like parliament or council chambers. So policy is about contesting <coughs> values and problematising social behaviour and issues. We talk of policy intervention <coughs> when the public sphere, often under political leadership, is going to intervene in the market or provide health and education. Policy affects real people, their life course, their opportunities for wealth, health and well-being. Policy can have bold goals driven by political and ideological aspirations, but it is necessarily subject to constant critical review to test its real consequences and outcomes. While academics are at the forefront of this critical review, they are not alone. The media, business interests, the public, and numerous social subgroups also want and need to better understand policy, its successes, and its failures. Policy interventions and government-level decisions have to be implemented into professional practice and operational delivery. This makes a key link between the strategy of policy and operational service delivery. Recognition of this complexity has led to the development of implementation theory, much of it developed by Michael Hill. Here, the study of public policy includes the role of managers and professionals and their ability to change the evolution of policy as it works its way into frontline operations. Public policy as an area of academic study relies on a multidisciplinary <coughs> approach. It draws from sociology, psychology, economics and politics. It uses both quantitative and qualitative methods. Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner in economics in 1975, articulated the idea of a rational decision-making process, and this was quickly applied to policy decisions in public organisations by numerous academics and policy makers. To quote Simon, the human being, striving for rationality and restricted within the limits of his knowledge, has developed some working procedures that partially overcome these difficulties. These procedures consist in assuming that he can isolate from the rest of the world a closed system containing a limited number of variables and a limited number of consequences. A rational approach to policy argues that there is a simple and logical progress of events whereby policy is formulated, implemented, and then evaluated. Numerous versions of this model have been drawn and redrawn in government reports and public policy textbooks in recent decades. The slide shows a simple, rational model of the policy process from the Scottish office. It starts with identifying clearly the problem that policy must act on. We can then observe that this part of the process involves the dialogue of politicians and civil servants. The reacting to public events, the media and social research. The process moves to formulating the detail of policy. Next, the articulated policy is passed to local government and local organisations, to managers and professionals for operational implementation. Finally, policy is evaluated and reflected on before being modified or fundamentally changed. 
Critics have argued that this rationalisation of public policy leads to a prescriptive practice whereby academics and policymakers try to apply a prescriptive ideal process into a disorganised and imperfect policy world. <coughs> We contrast the idea of a rational policy process with an alternative perspective. In a recent review by the National School of Government and the Public Management and Policy Association, in a report entitled Evidence-Based Policy Making, a number of distinguished authors, including Andrew Gray, Andrew Gray Peter Jackson and Wayne Parsons, Parsons, are searching questions of the idea of the rational scientific policy process. They describe the policy process as more surreal than rational, in one of the chapters, Louis Saxon used the metaphor of Dali's painting of the face of Mae West to illustrate the inevitability of multiple perspectives on the public policy process and the imp impossibility of one tidy process with a start and an end point agreed by all involved. So a more contemporary idea of the policy process is that it is non-linear, non-cyclic, disorderly, dynamic and interactive, an entanglement of different perspectives and arguments. These are dynamically argued and debated, <coughs> constructed of imperfect compromises and sometimes contradictory actions. Given this instability in the policy process, I argue that our understanding of the policy process is helped by patterns and metaphors that give us a good overall insight into the workings of the system. But as we venture into Dali's room and walk into a real world policy system, we have two key dimensions on which to build our analysis of the patterns of complexity. The first of these is time and the second is space. As my colleague Paul Stenner has said in a recent paper on the importance of these dimensions to the social sciences, all patterns are temporal but we can distinguish classes of patterns which are more obviously spatial. So a policy trend, a change in policy output over time, is a temporal pattern. Also, a system of policy organisations has a strong spatial element, being defined by different levels of policy organisation through national, subnational, local government and interlocal organisations. In the complex and unstable world of public policy, time and space give us two solid foundations on which to base our understanding. <coughs> if we see policy as an evolving process that links political action with the work of government employees, civil servants, bureaucrats, administrators, managers and professionals, it has become a linking of decisions and the interaction between people with different roles. So the study of policy trends, that is how policy evolves over time, is one key dimension of our study. With the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and see how policies have benefited or not from external events, either with the consequence of policy failure or policies, policy success. With hindsight, the future of economic policy to regulate the banking industry helped deliver the credit crunch. But in a previous time, financial <coughs> deregulation was viewed as a driver to economic expansion that would benefit the public good. Analysis by spatial coverage gives another key dimension to policy analysis. We can compare policy impact and intervention in different cities, different localities, and look to compare policy impacts between different nation states. We can see in the UK health inequalities with standard mortality rates that vary by as much as 10 years between major cities and towns. Policy time and policy space can be understood together as the policy system. We can think about policy as a social system, borrowing from social scientists like Durkheim, Parsons and Luhmann. The key here is the need to see a helicopter view, to see a grand narrative, a holistic perspective. Such an overview of structure becomes as important as the analysis of detail or micro behaviour. A system can have an aspect defined by physical space, national government, local government, policy organisations, and a dynamic element defined by time, policy formulation, implementation and evaluation. As Luhmann says of social systems, systems are constructed of communication, 
not individuals. Systems only exist because of the communication between individual people and the communication within the organisations that make up a policy system. Molia adds that organisations are themselves systems of decisions as they impose structure and selection to human communication. We can look to complexity theory and its concepts to assist us with understanding a dynamic and unstable policy system where there are conflicting perspectives and many different individuals and organisations at work. Complexity theory. This includes a wide range of literature and ideas that include chaos theory and goes far beyond it. It builds on some core ideas from modern science that relationship between entities can be subject to complex and emergent relationships that are not simply predetermined or predictable. It lends itself to the analysis of living systems where the system constantly evolves and changes, adjusting and developing from its own interactions. The critiques of the use of complexity theory in policy studies, such as Christopher Pollitt, are frustrated with its abstract generalisations and holistic models, its lack of ability to be demonstrated in workable empirical methods. Michael Barringer at MIT, Paul Cecilia at the University of Stellenbosch, are two theorists who have done much more than many to reduce complexity to some clear summary propositions. Complex systems are dynamic and not static. They have an interplay with chaos and non-chaos. That is an interplay with instability and stability. The tension between stability and instability is also referred to as being on the edge of chaos. In these systems, there's no predictable equilibrium, no guaranteed return to a balanced point. There is a constant entanglement and interaction of competition and cooperation. There are multiple levels. An emerging behaviour in one level usually results from behaviour at another level. This is often referred to as nested systems. Paul Cecilius, in his book Complexity and Postmodernism, provides us with a good summary account of the difference of a complicated system and a complex system. The jumbo jet is complicated. The city is complex. <clears throat> Many writers have paraphrased and summarised his definitions. The complicated system can be predicted to return to a stable state in a given time period. And if you're flying in a jumbo jet, you're probably very pleased to hear that. <laughs> But complex systems settle into a stable period of time, only settle into a stable period of time, but the details of this are not predictable. The complicated system has a series of controls that have predictable effects. The complex system is self-organising and diverse. It organises around regulations and rules, but any controls are limited in their predictability and may have unintended consequences. Elements in a complicated system can be understood as specialist parts and functions. In the complex system, the special parts and functions only make sense for integration and communication as they evolve and cooperate together. The parts and functions are less rigid. The complicated system is the sum of rational scientific processes that give predictable results in given external conditions. The complex system has dynamic and creative internal processes that are less likely to result in predictable outcomes as the system constantly changes and evolves. <coughs> I'm arguing that the policy environment has a high degree of instability. In part, this is to do with the complex layer of levels within the policy process, the spatial dimension, the interaction of global continental, national, sub-national, and numerous organisations working at the local level. This can be described as a nested system. It is a paradox that despite all this instability, we also find some attraction to order. The policy process is not completely in disorder, <coughs> you'll be pleased to hear. There are also patterns of order. The concept of attractors helps us to understand how these patterns of order emerge from instability. In part, the dynamic and unstable nature of the policy process can be understood by the complex interaction within the system. 
There is the power of agency, the influence of individual people, dynamic influences, not static variables. As Luhmann argued, all social systems are constructed by human communication and the forms that it takes. Complex systems, to a large extent, def <coughs> defy imposed, rational, top-down organisation. This is partly because they are self-organised and self-referential. The people and parts within the system feed back into the interactive process. They adjust their own behaviour and responses according to the messages they get from other parts of the system. Chaos theory originates from the natural sciences. It's been used to understand natural physical systems that, while deterministic over time, are highly irregular in outcome. The weather is an example of such a system. The events in these systems are not random. They have some relationship with intervening variables, and while irregular, they still have some order within certain boundaries. The challenge is that these deterministic patterns cannot be easily predicted by traditional scientific methods. Ian Stewart at the University of Warwick has observed that we can understand the difference by comparing a weather system with a tidal system. A weather system can be forecast in the short term on the basis of previous patterns and boundaries. It, can, it cannot be predicted with great precision. This is very different to the tidal system, which is a natural system that can be predicted with a very high level of precision. So the weather system gives us a good example of a chaotic system. For social scientists, policy systems are very much like the weather. Prediction within these systems is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Better for an economist to forecast short-term inflation will be in a range 2 to 3% than to predict it to be 1.6%. And the longer the economist looks into the future, the more difficult it will be to be accurate. I want to argue that academic and public understanding of public policy has not given enough credibility to this kind of instability. Instead, it's pretended for too long that public policy can be relatively easily controlled, directed and managed towards fixed outcomes. Another idea in chaos theory is that small changes in initial conditions can have exponential effects. This discovery is accredited to Lorenz's research on weather systems. It's claimed that he repeated a computer calculation experiment by accident using a slightly different number and then observed that this gave very different results in the final pattern. From this idea comes the so-called butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings in Mexico and causes a hurricane in Texas. Small things can have big consequences. Chaos provides social science with some interesting metaphors about unpredictable change. But in social science, the baseline data is socially constructed by, by people and their human political interactions. So it's impossible to prove the existence of chaos in abstract concepts like public policy systems. The best we can do is make arguments that things look like chaos. Here is an example of sudden and unpredictable change in a policy system. It's based on my research of the dynamic evolution of the social care market in England since the late 1970s. In the early 1980s, Rhodes Boyson, as Minister responsible for Social Security, made a small change to Social Security regulations that allowed poorer pensioners to claim expenses for living in private residential homes. Very quickly, the growing population of older people saw places in private care homes when their health began to fail and families found it difficult and expensive to help them. Nurses and social workers, frustrated with the difficulties of working for government, left to set up their own businesses, finding it relatively easy to borrow money to buy properties. Between 1984 and 1988, the number of private homes doubled from approximately 50,000 to 100,000. The blue line on the chart shows the very high rate of percentage change in the first few years. By the end of the decade, public subsidy paid on benefits so these private care homes had grown from tens of millions of pounds to nearly one billion. And the government had not planned or anticipated such a large-scale development of private residential care homes, had to change the policy by increasing local authorities' role as regulator and allocator of public subsidy. <coughs> Here was a small policy change with large consequences. 
a change that had created much instability in care provision and activities. Dooley and Van der Ven explored both chaos and complexity in public administration in a seminal article in Organisational Science. With the chaos instability metaphor, policy outputs become unstable over a short period of time because of the changing interrelation of a relatively small number of factors. Here, a policy output could be a quantity of a given treatment or the number of arrests for a specific criminal offence. Such instability is argued to be caused by a small number of factors, factors that have a disproportionate influence on the policy environment. This might be caused by the introduction of the policy itself or an external factor. The change in social benefits paid to older people in the early 1980s led to a rise in the setting up of private care home businesses. Alternatively, chaotic and unstable change may be caused by external factors independent of government action. For example, in the last year, the failure of banks to provide credit resulted in increased business failure, lower tax receipts, and con contributed to rising government expenditure and debt. In this second chart, headed complexity, Dooley and Van der Ven argue that the total instability on a measured output is reduced because of, because of underlying complex interactions, where a high level of known and unknown interactions give relatively more stability in total in the macro-organisational environment. In this example, there are local or specific places in the system where there's instability, but due to the high number of variables interacting with each other, the overall measure of instability at the macro level is reduced. There are some outbreaks of chaos and high instability within the system, but the overall system has enough coherence and stability to maintain a given policy direction. Some instability is effectively cancelled out at another level. In my research into the evolution of the social care market after 1990, there were numerous interactions of stability and instability, creating a more apparent picture of overall stability at the macro level. After 1990, the government regulated and managed the social care market in England, but there were many uncertainties due to changing labour and property costs. There was a new marketplace of diverse providers, but more of a sense of strategy and direction, with increasing numbers of older people receiving some form of community or residential assistance. There was some stability at the macro level, but many outbreaks of instability at the local level. This was illustrated by my research with Sue Ballack, Michael Hill and Laura Banks, funded by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, where we found extraordinary differences in local policy activity at a local level between 1990 and 2000. So the social care market had evolved from a highly unstable and chaotic state to a more complex policy environment where there were a larger number of factors interacting with each other. And instability was confined to different places at different times rather than being an overall feature of the whole macro policy system. Instability then, as argued by academics like Michael Barringer, is one aspect of complexity. My argument then is that the policy process and its organisational systems are more unstable and challenging than we like to admit. There has been a tendency for policy academics to emphasise the relative stability of policy processes rather than the relative instability. In path dependency theory, the initial evolving of the political process, its institutions and policy focus creates a highly stable policy environment that is character characterised by its lack of change and adaption. Esping Anderson argued from statistical evidence that national governments followed a clustering of core social policy characteristics that was in part determined by their post-war ideological features and dominant policy frameworks. Thus, he talked of liberal market regimes like the USA and Britain as compared with collectivist northern European countries of Scandinavia. Early historical and political events set long-term characteristics of policy institutions, which defined a stability of process and an overall predictability, apparently, of policy characteristics. Another major theory of policy trends that emphasises stability, punctuated equilibrium, emphasises that there are long periods of stability only occasionally broken by radical change. For example, at the macro level, 
the economic policy focus on market liberalisation and managing inflation with interest rates can be said to have dominated for over 25 years, only recently disrupted by the credit crunch and a move to the use of fiscal tax stimulus and major government intervention in bank lending. But one of the problems with these macro theoretical approaches of stability in path dependency and punctuated equilibrium is that they ignore the complex underlying process in detail, the activity at the more local level, the activities of managers, professionals, people implementing and administering the day-to-day -day outputs and services of public policy. Here there are frequently periods of instability and chaos that do not always penetrate to the higher levels of the policy process. <coughs> I'll now move on from the concept of chaos and instability to reflect on the idea of nested systems. The idea of a nested system is similar to the concept of fractals. This comes from the Latin word fractus, meaning broken or fractured. The concept was developed by scientists to describe things that reproduce themselves with similar patterns and representations at different hierarchical levels. In the natural sciences, a fractal is a natural pattern that reproduces itself with very similar structures at different levels. For example would be mountains, coastlines, certain plants, vegetables, ferns, cauliflowers. Fractals are defined recursively, <coughs> that is by reference to their own basic structure. And so a core structure or pattern is then reproduced in similar ways many times over. Fractals provide an interesting metaphor for exploring policy processes. The basic idea of a process, identifying the problem, formulating policy, implementing policy, and evaluating it, can be seen to be reproduced many times over through the policy system, at a high level, such as national government, but also within organisational layers of government. It's reproduced then in local government and local organisations. The process carries on, right down to small frontline teams and individuals that work with operational policy. <coughs> also, we might think of related organisational behaviours such as committees, professional teams, as types of fractals. Again, these are similar dominant forms of organisation in the policy process that reproduce themselves at different levels. But these different substructures of the policy process do not separate into isolation as they are constantly connected with each other. They interact and feed back into some overall grand narrative of the policy process. The effectiveness at one level is always interdependent with other levels. So while there are many differences in complex society, there are also similarities. And the similarities give us some order <coughs> and stability of structures. Lumen says of large social systems that they float on a sea of small-scale systems. <coughs> Let's move on to look at the metaphor of attractors, looking for order in apparently unstable patterns. A mathematical attractor is a notional central point within an unstable pattern of data. It is a form of central tendency, the exploring of a central point in relation to its boundaries and changing patterns over time. But it's the unstable form, the structure and the pattern of the data around the notional inner point that is of interest rather than the actual central point itself. An attractor helps us to understand order in disorder, to evaluate the edge of chaos. We can plot changing policy outputs over time and observe the notional central point of such patterns and speculate about what it is that gives some order to the plotted trajectory of changing data. We moved to look at um, Example of uh, inflation, UK inflation, from 1987 until 2004. And this attractor chart shows monthly changes, um, T minus 1. There's a lot of activity in the area between 0 and 0.5. The pattern's not symmetrical and it's disorderly. But the instability is restricted within boundaries, and really goes <coughs> outside these boundaries. We know that the core e economic policy at this time used to try and control inflation was Bank of, interest, Bank of England interest rates. So there's an attraction to order arguably caused by interest rates. But some instability in how the policy actually achieves this on a month-by-month -month basis. We can analyse this further 
by examining the change for each political, political government during that time span. The Conservative government, 1987 to 1990, looks relatively unstable. This was a period when inflationary problems were evident following market deregulation. John Major's Conservative government, with Kenneth Clark as Chancellor, looks relatively more stable. The Blair government from 1997 appears to do quite well in terms of inflation stability. And this is the period of time when the setting of interest rates was made more distant from political government. I hasten to add, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> Here, the attractor is separated into the three time series that represent the three different governments on the same axis scale, so it makes it a bit easier to compare them, from 1987 to 2005. Thatcher, Major, Blair. Thatcher's in dark blue, Major's in light blue, Blair's government is in red. While Blair's government sits in the stable middle area between the Thatcher and Major governments, things would look rather different perhaps if we added Gordon Brown subsequent figures. <laughs> Another way to understand the attraction to order in an unstable policy environment is to apply concept Polis' logics of social structure. He wrote of the competing logics in social organisations and the fact that some logics come to dominate policy practice in given periods, even though alternative perspectives still exist. For example, in the social care policy in England, the logic of marketisation came to dominate in the privatisation of care homes in the 1980s. Other policy logics still existed but a strong idea of creating consumer power to facilitate individual choice began to have more direct influence on the formulation and practice of policy, more than other logics. Other logics were still there in practice, sometimes in direct conflict and contrast to marketisation. But over time, it became increasingly difficult for local policy to escape the dominant attraction of marketisation. Another key logic in the development of policy at this time was the growing practice of market managerialism, with ideas of policy implementation taken from business and private organisations. Logics about the contribution of public professionals as the custodians of social care were less audible, and while still operating to some extent, had less influence on the manifestation of policy and its most visible outputs. To quote the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, an economy of logic allows fuzzy action, in the policy world, there are always many contradictions and challenges, and no opportunity to find complete and fully robust arguments. Next, the concept of interaction. Ideas from complexity theory suggest the need to be careful about statements of causality, where we say policy intervention A will determine policy outcome B. The focus shifts more to statements of interaction, so policy intervention A will result in policy outcome B, subject to certain responses from the people and processes concerned. The context and local and periodic conditions are all important. Outcomes are dependent on feedback. As Galbraith said, writing on the Great Crash of 1929, far more important than the rate of interest and the supply of credit is the mood. Speculation on a large scale requires a pervasive sense of confidence and optimism. The use of performance management to drive policy interventions towards clear output targets has had similar problems of misunderstanding with cause and effect. While attractive to politicians who want to demonstrate simple control of the policy environment and that they've succeeded in delivering increases in outputs, the process feedback difficulties of performance management are now legendary in both the media and academia. We have the recent story of an NHS hospital in Staffordshire that was so driven by some output performance targets that it lost the sense of the meaning and experience of care, resulting in a higher than expected mortality rate. Some of the failures of the policy of marketisation of social care have been identified as a misunderstanding about the ability and willingness of older people and other vulnerable people to play the market game, to feed back into a market system as active consumers <coughs> and assertive buyers of services. Baldock and Ungerson's classic study with the Joseph Browntree Foundation showed that the majority of older people studied did not behave as assertive consumers. Many avoided services and preferred to rely on family, neighbours, 
regardless of the consequences for themselves and others. They saw care as a reciprocal relationship rather than consumption in a marketplace. Many were passive and pleased to accept any help. They were not demanding or selective. So the policy of marketization overestimated the likely feedback interaction from its target audience. <coughs> I move to the concept of self-organisation, the last of these metaphors. The emergence of order from within the system. This takes us onto the front line of public policy, where the real experience and quality of policy outcome is or is not evident. The operational delivery of local and personal services. Much in public policy has been written over the years about the tension between top-down policy strategy as contrasted with the bottom-up incremental evolution of policy practice on the ground. <coughs> Important attempts have been made to draw these two perspectives together. Michael Litsky's seminal book published in 1984, The Street Level Bureaucrat, has stood the test of time very well. Litsky wrote of the power of frontline professionals to make their own sense of government policy so that they could continue to work with a coherent practice on the front line. In part, it tells of the limitations of macro-government policy and politicians to drive change. It shows the creativity and flexible response provided by frontline workers. But it needs to be remembered that the book is not a polemic written on behalf of professionals. It makes important points of criticism about the nature of professional practice and how such <laughs> practice may distance itself from service users. Lipsky sees an inevitable survival strategy developed on behalf of the weary professional that circumvents government directives. But he also makes important points about the need for users to be more directly integrated into the management of professionals, <coughs> so that professionals are more accountable at the local level. Indeed, many user involvement initiatives have been made in this direction in the recent decades. Given the interactionist perspective of complexity theory, Complexity implies that policy will inevitably always evolve and reproduce itself creatively on the front line, regardless of the details specified by politicians and policy makers. Ralph Stacey, Professor of Complexity Management at the University of Hertfordshire, argues this tru truism is not a statement of defeat for political and senior management. The issue for practice becomes how good self-organisation can be facilitated within, within organisations and made to reflect public need. He advocates good communication skills, dynamic teamwork, and high levels of personal intercommunication. A leadership that is driven from the front line wherever possible. There is a key moment in Jerry Robinson's television series of Managing and Leading an NH Trust, where he kindles the enthusiasm of a dedicated team of frontline professionals and invites them to realise their potential to take part in the day-to-day -day organisation of their working practices. This sets the catalyst for some key improvements in the efficiency efficiency and effectiveness of that NHS trust. Teams, committees, working groups provide the basic elements of organisation in the public workplace. It is often the ability of these processes to function and connect with local issues that determines the local quality of public service provision. Critics of the use of complexity theory in public policy have made it on its grand narrative, its helicopter view. Complexity and chaos theory they say is full of grand abstract statements and metaphors that have little link with empirical data. There's not enough use of data to operationalise its concepts. In the main, I accept some of these criticisms. But the criticism needs to be put back into the wider historical context, the difficulties of articulating any social science theory in sound method and practice. The abstract nature of social science theory and its concepts the social construction of data, the contamination of its method by subjective human subjects, are not new challenges, but as old as social science itself. My own view is not to look for the answers to these challenges in traditional scientific methods. This would apply the methods of complexity science instrumentally and without adequate reflection on the social context. Some work in American literature has sought to export chaos and complexity from the Santa Fe Institute in this kind of way. A large part of Kiel and Elliott's 1998 edited work on chaos in the social sciences seems to be dedicated to proving that mathematical chaos really did exist in US politics, crime and education. Instead, I prefer to use conventional social science mixed methods. 
I accept the challenge to move beyond metaphors and nice pictures of butterflies to real methods that can improve research findings and policy practice. Indeed, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council has just issued a multidisciplinary challenge with a funding called Complexity Science for the Real World. To quote Paul Cecilius, we may be able to learn a lot about the kind of dynamics involved in the functioning of these systems, but we will not be able to use these general principles to make accurate predictions for individual cases. Complexity theory underscores the importance of contingent factors and of considering the specific conditions in a specific context at a specific time. No general model can capture these singularities. So how then can complexity be made more relevant for the real world? for experiences at the micro frontline level, in terms of both research and practice. As a starting point, we have to accept the limitations of the methods we can develop, and accept that multiple methods we develop will at best only give us a partial view. Stacey puts emphasis on local stories and accounts in organisations, and looking for similarities that emerge from such accounts. He focuses on communication and shared perceptions, and how tensions and conflicts are managed on the front line. Similar localised case study methods offer much to complex understanding. But complexity theory is built on the assumption that we must see a helicopter view, we must see macro patterns, in addition to the emerging patterns at the local level. A fascination for myself is how to reconceptualise the use of social quantitative data. I believe that Charles Radin's work on qualitative comparative method, QCA, provides an important way forward with such methods. The aim is to use quantitative methods to understand the individual case and individual differences. His method can be used with small data sets or a subset, so it lends itself very well to the comparison, for example, of countries. It allows both the overall picture and some appreciation of diversity and difference at the case level. It assists with identifying contradictory patterns. Most importantly, it provides the opportunity opportunity to be able to identify multiple paths to an outcome. In other words, different social circumstances and policy interventions may be potentially linked to the same social outcome. Quantitative comparative analysis does not force data into a single generalised model where all error and explanation is aggregated into one final statistical argument. The more traditional statistical model aggregates and generalises variable scores, and so forces the cases to fit the best available single model. For example, the closest fit to a line, where much real-world data may be located away from the line. While this can give a limited overview at any one point in time, it ignores conflicting evidence amongst cases and groups of cases. It works by trying to aggregate tensions and contradictions. Criticism of the quantitative method is therefore that it always disaggregates the case or personal experience into categories and groups. QCA allows an integration of quantitative overviews and a better consideration of what is happening at the level of the individual case. When using the method in its simplest form, critical thresholds must be assigned for variables that are interval or ordinal. This allows all variables to be defined either above or below threshold, simply with a value of 0 or 1. All critical scores can then be displayed in a so-called truth table for the first visual comparison of cases. The research example in this slide examines the social and family structures of different countries to see how this is related to government policy expenditure for the long-term care of older people. In the example, the cases of countries taken from the recent ESRC funded research. The columns are critical threshold social network scores for older people. For example, column H shows that only Poland, Japan and Spain have above threshold values for household size with scores of 1. So there are countries with above threshold household size um, for older people. The final, column, the final column is the output variable, whether countries are spending uh, over 1% of GDP on long-term care policy for older people. 
New Zealand and Australia have identical scores for social network thresholds. <coughs> But a contradictory, uh, a contradictory score for expenditure on long-term care policy. Partial similarities can be observed. Hungary, Hungary, Poland and Spain have the same zero outcomes and also the same scores for variables in columns 5, 6 and 7. CH indicates high rates of contact with adult children in those countries. A indicates high numbers who have lived in the same area since birth in those countries, and AR indicates high numbers in those countries who agree that children should look after their parents. <laughs> Together, this is a collection of countries with stronger, more traditional social networks. <coughs> the truth table can be analysed into simple logical statements and summaries. This can be sh then show patterns with multiple causation. This is based on Boolean algebra. A capital letter indicates the presence of an above threshold score. <coughs> a small case letter indicates the presence of a below threshold value. So small case H indicates below threshold household size amongst older people. Capital M means above threshold marriage rates amongst older people. The use of plus means or, the use of the multiplication sign means in addition to. So, the example here is for outcome one, the countries with higher expenditure on long-term care policy. There are eight countries in this group. They all share characteristic of small age, that is, um, smaller household size amongst older people. But then there's two subgroups which is where the approach allows us to demonstrate some complexity rather than one single model. <coughs> the first group has five countries, the capital M showing above average, uh, higher threshold uh, marriage rates, smaller numbers of single person households, uh, and smaller, uh, a smaller amount of contact with adult children. In the other subgroup with three countries, marriage rates are below threshold, so single person households are high on the above threshold uh, and the small a indicates um, the low threshold scores for uh, attitudes to those who think that children should look after their parents. Interesting, you'd be interested to know that UK and USA fall into that group. So there are two quite different groups of countries with active expenditure on long term <laughs> care policy. We can see contradictions and complexity in the data without having to produce a single argument to demonstrate higher policy expenditure. Country subgroup statements are not necessarily linked to outcome statements. Patterns of thresholds can be looked at separately to outcomes. Here, Great Britain and the USA are above threshold on the number of single person households, so they have a capital S, and below threshold on household size marriage rates, area lived in since birth, and attitudes of duty uh, of care that children should look after their parents. So arguably social networks of older people are comparably weaker in these countries, <coughs> and this does have policy implications. So that was an example of a different kind of quantitative approach, of system process analysis. Examples of the work of John Seddon, who's reported to a House of Commons Select Committee on the limits of traditional performance management and Julian Pratt, well known for his work on encouraging organisational partnerships. With this method, the idea is to consider the functioning of a given policy system, and this can be done at different levels. The example here looks at a university school, showing the process of student intake, learning and teaching activity, assessment and outflows. The white text shows the main work activities, and the arrows begin to link them. The red text illustrates some of the perceived strengths yellow text some of the current risks and challenges, perhaps linking them with particular activities. Workflow analysis diagrams are designed to provide an overview systems analysis of systems performance. They never look at one aspect in isolation, but seek to examine interconnectivities and interactions. This should reduce the likelihood that one or two performance indicators will skew the system behaviour <coughs> and create undesirable unintended consequences. 
The idea is to get such diagrams drawn and analysed by the people working directly in the relevant part of the system, not only by a few managers at the top of the process. In this way, the system is able to reflect on itself and feed back relevant changes into the system from the bottom up. Another related management approach idea <coughs> is that of the indicator dashboard. Here the idea is to get a wide range of quantitative data used to inform an integrated approach. Those working with such, in such complex systems have a range <coughs> of indicators to assist them. The judgments about whether to respond to the indicators depend on qualitative judgment about what's on the road ahead and also what's in the rearview mirror, recent lessons from history. The idea of the indicator dashboard is to facilitate policy managers having a good overview of the policy environment and not to fixate on a few points of detail. Again, data use facilitates contextually informed decision making and adaptation rather than focusing only on singular and specific issues that have unintended consequences elsewhere in the system. So what then are the key methods for professional and managerial practice in the policy world? In the words of David Kerning, rather than spend time on detailed planning and striving to calculate a solution by the continuous addition of rules and measurement, decision makers should be content with setting minimum specifications, establishing boundaries and letting the system settle into a condition that satisfies the constraints placed upon it. <coughs> the system cannot be completely controlled, the detail is partially out of control and there are always limitations to action. Action should be within the context of the larger systems. There are dangers with system disruption that there is too much micromanagement in public policy. Why intervene and interfere in professional systems if they're working well with their own self-organisation? But there is a need for large-scale intervention when systems are failing. You only take big, big risks with action if you really need to, if the system is in a poor condition. In part, this is because you cannot be totally confident of a positive outcome. Politicians, senior civil servants, as policy makers and strategy makers, need adaptive planning, the ability to change direction and not to stick rigidly to a long-term plan. Strategies and plans may need to adapt quickly to instability, to changes in the external environment. In a public lecture, the final challenge is to reduce this to something for people to take away. So here is an attempt at an airport paperback, five point something. Don't micromanage. Do both synthesis and analysis. The big picture is as important as the detail. Celebrate positive feedback systems. But some places are trapped in negative feedback. Consider intervening on a large scale. Listen to the local context and stories. But from an academic, the last word has to be a word of caution. There are dangers with over-summarising the complex. As the great Albert Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Peter Hall, one of the independent governors, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Lord Mogg, our chairman, who can't be with us tonight. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to Phil. Why is, wow, as he introduced us to a fascinating subject. Maybe when you get home tonight, you'll uh, watch the news. I guarantee it'll be full of policy stuff. Um, how close to the edge of chaos, that interesting <laughs> phrase that we learn. A good discussion with whoever you're watching the news with, a good topic. Um, I want to say a few thank yous. First of all, to all of you for coming. You had a choice tonight. It was St. George's Day barbecue night. The sun was shining, but you chose to come in here to hear a fascinating subject in a windowless room. So uh, well done and thank you for that. Uh, secondly, in advance, to say thank you to our catering team, who I understand have got some nibbles and things outside as well as uh, some other forms of liquid refreshment. Thirdly, to say a big thank you to our marketing and communications team quite a flashy poster thing on here and they've done a good job in, in getting us all here so uh, thanks to them and finally most important duty is on behalf of the chairman to present Phil with a certificate to mark this auspicious occasion thank you for being here and uh, let's go and uh, 
party outside. Thank you. <laughs>